Welcome to the National Museum of Women in the Arts. My name is Lori Mertes. I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I am very happy to have you here. Um, I know the sun beckons, so I truly equally appreciate your attendance here today. Fresh Talk is where we're at. It's the signature program of the museum's new public program initiative focused on women, arts, and social change. What does that mean exactly? Well, we're hoping to create a public forum for talking about issues and ideas that reflect the museum's mission of advocacy and commitment to championing women through the arts. For each Fresh Talk, we pose a question to start a dialogue on issues that are relevant to us all, highlighting women and the arts as catalysts for change. After each program, we adjourn for either a catalyst cocktail on Wednesday evenings or in the case of today, a Sunday supper. And that is a space where we invite you to talk about what inspired you here today, what motivated you, what made you think about something in a new way. We have a bite, we drink some wine, we share our thoughts, and hopefully together we come up with a strategy for change. This is our final Fresh Talk this season. We launched in October. In the past year since we launched, we have talked about gender parity in the art world, an artist's social responsibility, genderless design, and the power of an artist using science and technology to heal the environment. We have much more in store for you next year when we launch in October, uh, in the fall. If you've not already joined the museum and become a member, I urge you to. Our um, membership director was here earlier watching the film Vaja and reminded me to plug her membership. Please join. Um, <laughs> but that way you will hear, be among the first to hear about our upcoming programs. So I urge you to do so if you have not already. Fresh Talk is just the beginning of all the amazing things that are happening at the museum these days. And as we approach our 30th anniversary next year, um, there's just so much going on. Um, while I'm at it here, I have to do a job for Kaylee. Let's see if we move forward. Oh, that's me. Um, to mention at the bottom, we have Fresh Talk and our, our hashtag Fresh Talk for Change. Um, I also want to mention to you in your handout, you also have all of our, address, our addresses for Instagram and Facebook and all that good stuff to make sure everyone is very jealous that you're here with us today and they're not. So, to our program. Yes, it's National Bike Month. Yes. <laughs> and yes, you're at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. What do those two have to do with each other, you may ask? Okay, the bicycle is not only a beautifully designed functional object. The bicycle can also be a canvas for good causes, for personal expression, for civic mindedness, and for expressing our political beliefs. But are you still wondering why the Women's Museum? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. The ways in which the bicycle has served as an agent of change, empowering women with the freedom of mobility and independence as long ago as the 1890s to today for women and girls across the globe who continue to face oppression. We have an amazing group of speakers with us here today. You can learn more about them in your handout. And in a moment, Sue Macy will kick us off with a talk based on her book, Wheels of Change, published by, the National, by National Geographic, who kindly helped bring Sue with us here today. After Sue's keynote, the rest of us will move to the stage for a conversation that will last about 60 minutes, and then we're going to head downstairs to Sunday supper. Instead of the traditional Q&A, we turn the, the day over to you. You will be handed a card as you exit this space. I have a perplexed look there. What does that mean? Um, you will be handled a table card, sort of wedding style. And that will direct you to a table that has a designated card number as well. And that's really a way for you to disperse across the room and perhaps have a conversation with folks you haven't met before. You don't have to go to your table, so don't worry if you want to hang out with your friends. <laughs> but it's, it is a fun thing to do. And the one thing we ask you is to really participate and to talk to each other and to exchange and to talk to us via the various vehicles we have in different activities. 
Before I close, I want to thank everyone for a great first season, to our donors, to our audiences, and the behind the scenes team that have made this first season happen, and most especially thanks to Kaylee Bryant Greenwell, who is the one who's always downstairs, doesn't get to join us. She's our public programs coordinator, and she makes so much of this happen. And so, before I finish the final formalities, I don't just talk about bicycles, I ride them too. Um, and I know the joy of being on a bicycle, but I have to say, the first picture is my first bicycle ride. I was seven years old. The second picture is my first bicycle ride when I was 38 years old. I did not know how to know, ride a bike until I was 38. Lynn too, I got some hands. <laughs> and so, without further ado, on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Sue Macy, and I thank you all for being here. If you look in Wheels of Change, you could see me on a tricycle when I was about three. So it's, uh, it, it was there from the very beginning of my life, but I didn't realize the, the rich history of women and bicycles. Um, so today was kind of a windy day for a bicycle ride, but can you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine riding in corsets and very heavy skirts on uh, muddy, unpaved roads with horses that were either running at you or, or running away from you. That's, that's what women in the 1890s had to deal with. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit here to set up the rest of the day. Uh, OK, here it is. <laughs> OK. Um, I, I wrote Wheels of Change because I had come across a lot of um, feminists talking about how important bicycles were in the history, at the time, in the 1890s and 19, early 1900s, and I wondered why. Um, so when I was doing my research, um, one of the quotes that I found was this one from Muncie magazine, Muncie's Magazine, which is a mass market magazine in uh, 1896. To men, the bicycle in the beginning was merely a new toy, another machine added to the long list of devices they knew in their work and play. To women, it was a steed upon which they rode into a new world. So I was, um, it, it made sense, and this is actually um, an expression of what I found as I did my research, that the bicycle was revolutionary. Um, Added to that, uh, well, we're, we're not, there, not there yet, but um, Susan B. Anthony, as many of you probably know, was famously quoted as saying, let me tell you what I think of bicycling. I think it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. I stand and rejoice every time I see a woman ride by on a wheel. So, one of the reasons that Susan B. Anthony and other people felt that the bicycle was, was such a great um, vehicle for the emancipation of women had to do with the clothing women wore. This is what many women wore in the mid-19th century. Uh, needless to say, wearing corsets and crinolines was impractical as well as dangerous once women discovered the bicycle. The rush to cycling in the 1890s led to lasting dress reform. Uh, women found different ways of dressing, and I know that those of you who went on the ride actually got a pair of bloomers. I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> but um, some women brought back bloomers from the 1850s, which, which had been a, a feminist expression of of the need for uh, more comfortable garments, um, but had, had fallen in disrespect. By, well, actually, men were really kind of horrified by bloomers because they felt that women should not wear bifurcated garments of any sort. <laughs> um, but the, um, some women did start wearing bloomers again. Uh, this is a, the cover of a cigar box from the 1890s. And it actually shows different outfits for, wear, for riding bikes, but the center woman is seen as uh, 
satirical, has drawn satirically, I feel. <laughs> um, but sh but that is that was the the fear that women would become so uh, masculine in their in their dress um, that there was a backlash against bloomers. Um, so the alternative, <laughs> this is a piece of sheet music. There were hundreds of songs written about uh, bicycles in the 1890s because it was a very popular uh, way of um, entertainment, uh, a mode of entertainment back then and the bicycle was a topic that came up over and over again. But this woman is wearing uh, kind of tights with a shorter skirt and that became one of the alternatives to bloomers. Um, there are also um, women who wore skirts that were gathered. These, um, these were outfits to fit on a uh, paper, paper dolls that were issued by the Pope Manufacturing Company, which was a maker of Columbia bicycles. So they got into the whole uh, discussion of what women should wear by issuing these uh, paper dolls, which were designed by um, leading dress reformers at the time. There was, a, there was a move for rational dress that started in England, and the, the point was that women should be able to dress in a more functional way, and the bicycle really moved that along. Um, and by the, by the 20th century, corsets were on their way out, Everyday dresses were, were getting shorter. The, the heavy, bulky garments that used to drag on the street and pick up cigar butts and whatever else <laughs> was on the street were, were no longer in favor. And, and really, the bicycle was, was the catalyst for a lot of this change. Uh, the bicycle also had an, an impact on how men and women interacted. Uh, at the time, in many families, uh, women, young women would socialize with men by meeting them in the parlor with their parents looking on, <laughs> and there was no privacy. Suddenly, women were able to uh, go out on the road and meet who knows what <laughs> without their parents um, knowing about it. And this led to friendships, and it led uh, to romance. It, um, it also, this is a, another piece of sheet music. Um, it also led to, um, to well, this is, this is actually one of my favorite pictures that I have in the book. Um, it's from Denver. So it also led to uh, tricycles and bicycles being built for two, and the famous song, which is actually called Daisy Bell, about a girl who looks sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. Uh, and so it was, it was a, a social mechanism for men and women to meet in a more uh, relaxed uh, environment. <laughs> uh, there were satires about loose women. <laughs> this was uh, from a newspaper at the time. Uh, and there was outrage from do-gooders who worried about the impact of cycling on the social order. And most famous among those was a woman named Charlotte Smith, who was actually a feminist champion of working girls. She put together the first directory of, um, of women-owned businesses, uh, I think, in, at the time. But she believed that the bicycle was quote, the devil's advance agent. And she fervently believed that many a girl has come to her ruin through a spin on a country road. <laughs> and she, what she was worried about was that um, the bicycle would let, lead to women being morally corrupted because they wouldn't have anyone supervising them. They could fall prey to uh, charming uh, men, and so she, she launched a campaign against uh, the bicycle. And fortunately, most people, most of the people she depended on to support her, including the clergy, uh, blatantly rejected her arguments and felt, I, I have a quote from one uh, 
clergyman who said, we have two bicycles at our church that the family uses. So, so she did not succeed. And I think her heart was in the right place, but she definitely was, was not in, in, uh, in the swing of things, I guess. Um, there are also doctors who, who uh, caution women against riding. They said it could interfere with the ability to have babies. Um, and then there was, there was the doctor who felt that women were uh, turning to cycling, quote, as a means of gratifying unholy and bestial desires. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they determined that the shape of the seat of the bicycle could result in uh, stimulation to sensitive areas. So this, this is one of the seats that was um, designed to, to fight against that. In this seat, uh, it tilted backwards. So you would avoid unwanted pressure to, um, to those areas and you could maintain a graceful attitude as it says in the ad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but that was, a, that was um, actually, there was a Toronto newspaper that had a whole article about this, this uh, threat to women's virtue. Um, but in the long run, people uh, with clearer heads uh, prevailed. And most physicians saw the benefit of the bicycle. Uh, they cautioned about the evils of cycling um, when you were pregnant and actually within a certain time of, of your uh, menstrual period. But otherwise, they felt it was a good, healthy exercise. Um, and the French, uh, there was a French physician who actually reacted to those claims about uh, stimulation. He said, those who wish to indulge in such practices will not take the trouble to cycle to obtain their gratification. <laughs> <laughs> the French always know how to, <laughs> how to end an argument. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, the bicycle was actually the first large-scale physical fitness activity for women. And um, while a lot of women just took part for their own uh, enjoyment and social uh, uh, outings, some of them really embraced the competitive nature of the sport. And I write a lot about women's sports history, so this is actually one of the other reasons I ended up looking into this, because there were women who ra raced bicycles. Um, even in the day of the ordinary, the high wheeler, when most women didn't ride because there was no room for your, for your skirts. Um, this is Louise Armando, and she is a French Canadian. She was an early champion during the high wheel era. She raced men, she raced dogs and horses. Anybody who would race her, she, she would race. And she often beat them. Um, and in um, 1891, she took part in a race with the, with the safety, the, the bike that we all know today with the same size wheels. Uh, th this particular race, these were uh, some of the competitors. It was on a track, a, an indoor wooden track, an eighth of a mile uh, long. And the women, it was a marathon race. They rode for three hours every night for six nights in a row. And your accumulated distance was what determined the winner. And Armin Doe, who was older by then, uh, she was near the begin, near the head of the pack uh, through the first four nights, and then she got sick. And Frankie Nelson in the middle, and here's an actual picture of her uh, from Brooklyn, <laughs> ended up uh, winning. And she traveled a total of 264 miles. Uh, and two laps. And this race was in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was reported every day in the, in the local papers, and it was reported ahead of time. They did profiles of the women. So these women were really uh, public figures, uh, which was amazing at a time when women didn't really take part in sports publicly. Very The women who played baseball at Vassar College did it in a field that no one could see specifically, you know, purposely. So this was pretty amazing. Um, besides the indoor racers, there were marathoners who rode outdoors, and this was one of my favorites. Dora Reinhardt was from Colorado, 
and in 1896 alone, she rode over 17,000 miles. And this was through the hills and often unpaved roads in Colorado. She had 10 days in a row and then 20 days in a row where she rode a century each day, which is 100 miles. And she was married. Um, she said she didn't like to go out on a ride with her husband because he couldn't keep up with her. <laughs> and uh, in Denver, someone created a, a culotte named after her, the Reinhardt skirt. So, and I, I, there were so many more that I didn't even come up against. I, I, I could have done more and more research and found local heroes like this everywhere. Um, this, the bicycle was also embraced by celebrities of the day, and Frances Willard was another person who sort of made me curious about this topic. She was the head of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she learned to ride a bicycle when she was 53, which when I first came across that seemed really old, and now it seems really young. <laughs> but, but she wrote a book called um, A Wheel Within a Wheel, or How I Learned to Ride the Bicycle, and it became a bestseller. And it's back in print. It's a short book. It's, it's kind of her philosophy of life as seen through the bicycle. And she said, I began to feel that myself plus the bicycle equaled myself plus the world, upon whose spinning wheel we must all learn to ride. So she was, she was one of the people who really um, was a role model for women who wanted to cycle. And here she's, she went to, she was in England at the time and she learned how to ride the bike, how to take it apart, how to put it back together. She spent three months learning this in order to become the cyclist that she was. <laughs> And this is uh, Frances Benjamin Johnson, a uh, gender fluid <laughs> photographer. Uh, she was actually the official White House photographer for five presidents. And here you have her in her mustache. Um, she was a photographer for, uh, from Harrison to Taft. And my favorite, Annie Oakley, who I also write, wrote a book about once, but she, she was a sharpshooter who traveled with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and um, she was quoted in a British cycling magazine as saying she was equally as fond of her bicycle as her horse. And I had this picture from my previous project, and I remembered that there was a bicycle in her tent. This is where she stayed when she was in England. Um, and then Marie Curie and Pierre took a cycling honeymoon for their uh, marriage. So uh, by, the, by the end of the 1890s, or by the middle of the 1890s, it wasn't only celebrities who were riding bikes. Uh, the bicycle, um, new bicycles were produced every year, and the, the, the old models were half the price of the new models. So it was a very affordable uh, uh, indulgence for everybody and everybody was proud of their bike and there are lots of pictures of women posing with bicycles and unfortunately I don't know this woman's name there if you even look on eBay you'll find all these pictures of women and bicycles and yeah but they're not always identified but it it had invaded uh, American culture in many ways and as you see from the, some of the pictures I showed it, it, it influenced music and literature and design and the very landscape of America. Streets started to be paved because of the lobbying of, of cyclists and so it was um, a prized possession and it provided mobility, freedom and fun for the masses. So, and now we'll hear about bicycles today. <laughs> Thank you.